Welcome to the Future of Impact, a show where we create solutions and build a world where missions, metrics, and incentives align to actually get problems solved. We are on a mission to find innovative ways to accelerate change and make impact in industry. But we can't do it without the right metrics, and we can't do it alone. This is not a job for one or even a few. We all stand to succeed by working together. We are the future of impact. I'm your host, Jess Merrill. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to Future of Impact. My name is Rita Risha. I'm one of the producers of the show, and I'm joined today with your host, Jess Merrill. Hello, Jess. How are you doing? Hello, Rita. It's great to be reunited. Full circle. Yes, full circle. We've had many episodes at at this point, um, just about 14. You've been able to speak from people from different sectors of impact, space, crypto, music. I mean, all areas from all over. And it's just time for us to take a look back, reflect, and see how you enjoyed this season and maybe things that our listeners might have missed from listening to the episode. So are you down for that? Down for it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So to round it out, before we dive into the nitty gritty, I was curious, what is one thing that all of the guests had on the show where you interviewed them and they had that like one thing in common? It's a great question. I think that for me, the, you know, after 10 plus, almost 15 interviews in the books of season one, Um, And as you referenced, you know, we spoke with a wide variety of people from nonprofit executives to, you know, the funder side to technology platforms to, you know, just really kind of every, you know, multiple different, uh, you know, donor like new funding sources. Um, I think hope is the is the component that I'm, you know, kind of left being most excited about um, in that. Everybody, you know, really spoke to this idea of like being so committed to what they're doing, really being able to move the needle forward on things. And I think that not only is it just always hopeful to hear from people in the impact space because they are the people doing, you know, the work to make our world a better place, but it's also really just hearing everyone's belief that the industry is headed in the right direction. And that when you really look at things from a macro level um, and you're not just kind of with your head in the weeds and, and you know, grinding on the day to day, that we are headed in a great direction um, and that the industry is really making some great strides, especially over the past two years with um, kind of getting out of their old ways and, and really seeing opportunity and room for innovation. And there's some new players in the space and it's just really exciting. Yeah. It seemed like when I was listening through and helping on the back end, producing some of these episodes that absolutely everyone just had a desire to make change and they were on board with whatever innovations were possible in order to make that impact and change happen. So I'm sure throughout those conversations, um, it may have kind of lit a fire in you, hopefully inspired you as well. I mean, I got that a little bit from listening to the episodes. So what did you individually learn or what inspiration did you gain actually from this season of Future of Impact? Did anything surprise you? Um, I think that it, I don't know if I would say surprising, but the thing that gives me the most excitement um, and kind of gives me some more clarity um, on what our unique, you know, component to this building this solution might be, is that it doesn't take something groundbreaking and major and overly complicated to make major steps in impact. You know, you think about, um, you know, a lot of what Kim Flores talked about in in the first, you know, official or I guess live first live episode um, in in these, you know, all these things that we've tried to to measure and to kind of like attach to, you know, correlations of like how to help, you know the youth be successful um, and how to like bring up youth successfully, um, you know, in our country. And it really comes down to like human connection. Did they have a meaningful connection with an adult in their life? Did somebody ask how they were doing and really like these basic, you know, how do we treat humans like humans? Or you think about Steve Latham with Donate Stock uh, and how, you know, he really just realized that there was all this tax benefits to donating stock, but why wasn't it being done at scale um, and then creating a platform? for, you know, donors to be able to very um, frictionlessly um, donate their stock, which has a great, you know, has a great uh, advantages for nonprofits to unlock more, you know, funding opportunities, but also has a really great um, benefits to people who are looking to do philanthropic giving um, outside of just giving cash or time. Well, 
you mentioned, Kim, why don't we take down a trip down memory lane and look at one of those uh, clips from that first episode together to kind of give the audience a little bit more context as to the inspiration that you gained from that specific episode. So let's go back in time to Kim's episode. <laughs> Are you ready? Yep, for sure. <laughs> Phenomenal. Okay. When young people have a positive sense of identity, have strong well-being, have social skills and social capital in their lives, they are much more likely to do well in school. They're much yeah. more likely to do well in career. And so we could start to think about social emotional learning as a proxy for some of those things. In my mind, I think even more important than those things, it's cool that it leads to them, but it's, right. it's really about the whole young person's development, not just their academic success although it leads to academic success. So that was a huge new line of research that was happening in this space that opened up the door and got us out of this weird habit of measuring things that were mis misplaced. Measuring things that were misplaced. What does she mean when she brings that up? And what does that bring up for you from that episode? I think for me, it just brings up the the new insights and new information that's available to us, um, you know, by way of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Kim and her team were doing individual consulting that was only available, you know, from at their at PhD level consultants coming in to help, you know, organizations survey and measure their impact. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that was only available for organizations who had the deep pockets to be able to bring in that level of, of brain power and consulting. And, you know, through the, the innovation and creation of their, of their platform, Hello Insight, that's now available at scale to pretty much every, you know, based on the, the low out-of-pocket cost to access that technology and that software for, you know, really any organization in the country to, to be able to take advantage of, to understand is what you're measuring really driving the impact. And I think that it's always best intentions, right? Like people go into things with like, this is what we know now. And there's like that, you know, the famous Maya Angelou quote, which I will botch, but about, you know, do the best until you know better and then do better. Um, you do the best with what you know until you know better and then do better. And that like we've, the industry has been doing the best with what was available to us at the time. But as technology has now accelerated our ability to measure impact, we know better. And now the industry is doing better. Absolutely. I think for the specific um, sector of, of impact that she was um, measuring, it's probably not very common for the school system or um, that general area to, to want to measure data in that way, right? Like what's so significant about um, even further, like the, the people and the organizations that she's impacting that maybe wouldn't be able to have had that before? I think that, you know, there's many benefits to it and it's transforming, you know, at all different systems levels, um, our ability to, to make an, you know, more positive impact on young people's lives and help them have, you know, thrive and have more successful lives and futures. But I think that, uh, what it's doing is it's kind of streamlining the work, right? It's giving us the ability to see that it doesn't require as much as is being done and is not as resource intensive. That if you're running an entire organization, like let's say an organization similar to a Boys and Girls Club, mm -hmm. and your budgets are being allocated to a wide variety of programming and different, you know, activities and resources to understand, are you being impactful? That if it really, really boils down to not that they went into a soccer program versus a ballet program or a cooking class, but that, an, you know, an adult in the program connected on a daily basis with each of these students to ask how their day was you know, using the data from the surveys that an organization like Hello Insight gives you access to, that you could really streamline a lot of your overhead and expenses and really kind of, you know, fine tune and focus on the things that you know are having the most impact. What would you say from that episode, um, if people weren't listening closely enough that they might have missed or gotten wrong? I mean, I think, you know, one of the most impactful things for me was um, understanding the history of how we got to where we're at today. You know, I, I can look at as, you know, in any day now having a my first child, um, and, but then having so many friends and family members who have raised children and being raised, you know, in the 80s that you can see now like children are so overscheduled and there's so much emphasis more than there ever was when I was growing up and certainly our parents on 
grades and scores and standardized tests and are you you know learning the violin at three and are you curing cancer by 10 yes um, <laughs> then mapped out a very clear and easy to understand path as to how we got to where we're at um, and I think that understanding how we got to where we're at is the key to understanding how we can iterate and and improve and evolve going forward well speaking of iterate and improving and forward thinking Another great moment was Give Pact, episode five with Stephen and Alicia. Um, they are just amazing with what they're doing. Crypto already as it is, is a wild, wild west of the internet. So let's take a look at what they had to say as a standout moment in the episode and talk about it. Awesome. It's sort of like you take fundraising and you take governance of capital and you take volunteering and you smush it all into one. And now you have this like organization that's sort of firing in all cylinders. So like you get a token in return for your donation and that token allows you to vote on how the funds are ultimately used. You sort of, it, you, you make things now grassroots and bottom up versus top down. It's not like you just donate to Planned Parenthood, this, which is a great organization, but they're like a mega corporation basically. And they sort of have their top down system of filtering that money from the top down. This is like community coming together getting the token in exchange for the donation, now being able to vote on how those funds are used. In the season, we talk a lot about community up, funder down. And I felt like that moment was, was almost parallel to that. What were your thoughts on this episode and that general idea? Yeah, I mean, I, what Stephen and Alicia are doing with Give Pact is really exciting. I mean, you know, say what you will or have whatever opinions or obviously, you know, if you're watching this anywhere close to November 16th, 2022, um, you know, you may have some strong opinions or have heard some really, you know, crazy things going on in the world of Web3 um, and cryptocurrency. But this is the future. Um, it is here now. It's working through things the same as the, you know, Web Web 1.0, the, you know, original internet worked through its, its kinks throughout the years. And now it's like existing, web, you know, kind of around us all the time without yeah. we, we are completely reliant on it. Um, I love the idea of it being a technology and a platform that will facilitate this, um, you know, ideal world in which, you know, most of the nonprofit and impact industry um, has viewed, you know, the ideal of where we're headed, which is how do we allow our decisions to be driven by the needs of the community that we're impacting um, and have the resources um, meet that. And so, you know, again, based because of um, you know, and this gets touched on in Pat McNamara's episode, it gets touched on in most of the, you know, kind of executive director, CEO episodes uh, of, of the nonprofits is that there is a reason and a history as to why things are have been done the way that they were done and why they kind of evolved over time to where they're at now. But I think the exciting thing is, is that funders are really starting to understand the impact and want to make the changes. You know, this trust-based philanthropy is a, is a big term that came up a number of episodes in that how do you um, mitigate risk as a large funder while also giving voice and trust to the community that you're, you know, the communities that you're serving. And I think that GivePact um, and the Web3 community and evolution and that technology is, is going to be the, the structure that allows for this real expansion into community up because it'll be able to be tracked um, in a very transparent, um, you know, in a transparent technology driven efficient way. I think there's another responsibility, too, that ties in into another moment. It's not just, um, you know, the financial side of, of the Internet, but also the responsibility for the content that we share online as well and the stories that we share. And um, I really personally enjoyed the episode you did with Britt, episode seven, where she talked about that the work she was, do was doing to share stories and make sure um, that voices uh, that in communities were of most need were being heard and being shared. So let's take a look at that episode clip together and talk about it. <laughs> what we're doing is, is in, engendering a long-term feeling of joy in reflection of an organization. And I often say we make FOMO videos. We want to make stuff that people are like, this is so cool. I need to be a part of it. And that's hard to measure because it's a long-term relationship we're building. And so we don't measure our impact and views. We measure in kind of bigger picture ideas. We've heard from so many of our clients that like that grant video got them a grant two years after we made the video for them. You can't measure the impact of it right away, which is I think how this, like our culture is right now. Like, 
who's going to want to be my partner after I launch this piece. But it's really more of like a long-term relationship building kind of storytelling. I mean, long-term relationship storytelling, the looking at the right data, the right metrics, even though it's a different kind of um, operation she's running, very parallel to many of the themes that we've explored and in season one of the show, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. I think that, um, you know, Britt knocked it out of the park with a number of different things in that. And this was a, another common theme. You know, you asked me like the first question and I said hope. And I then as I'm saying it, I'm like, oh, that came up a lot. That came up a lot. And I think this idea of long term relationship building um, is really, I think, the direction the world is headed right now coming out of the past two and a half years, um, almost three now that, you know, was, you know, probably kind of the the end of the tale of the burst of technology that allowed us to be connected by being disconnected, um, that people are yearning for human connection. And I think that now we're getting more comfortable. How do we leverage the best of technology and robots, as we say, uh, my team says, but with the best of humans and and get and let allow technology to free us up to be able to make those deep human connections. And so it requires a different way of thinking because it's not as transactional in a short term way. And so the way that you know, everybody in the impact space has been used to, you know, for the previous, let's say, 20 or 40 years, um, raising money, engaging with, you know, funders, um, creating awareness about their organization, tapping into and understanding the needs of the community and how to measure the impact that your organization is having. These things are becoming, in the one hand, much easier to measure, but on the other hand, more complex to build sustainability because people don't want you to just give a phone call or shoot an email or send a text because you need $100 or $100,000. They want to be a brought al along and be a part of that story. And so it changes the way that you're telling that story. I think it changes the emphasis on storytelling. I think storytelling becomes um, incredibly more important and valuable because it is the way to make people feel connected at scale. Um, so taking amazing storytelling and human connection and pairing it with t distribution that technology now allows us to have, that you could, you could go even further than you've ever been able to go, but it starts with that core of, are you able to clearly communicate and tell these emotional stories and, and showcase the impact that your organization's having? Um, and then I also think that, you know, one of my other favorite clips, that, you know, I, you, I was limited in what we were able to pull for this episode, but one of my other favorite clips was like, you know, basically Brit saying like, going viral, like it's kind of bullshit these days, right? Like it used to yeah. be back in the day, but like, if you're even asking for something to go viral anymore, you're like, you're so, that's such a boomer thing to ask. So like, yeah, go viral anymore. <laughs> no, I think that's so significant. The, a couple points, like how, uh, how nonprofits are going to scale, um, build those relationships at scale, how they will make that impact the stories that are shared the whole narrative has changed because the world has changed. And that's part of the reason why this podcast really excites me and the work that you're doing with the show. It's we're just doing that. We're really trying to get many voices, many narratives pulled together and show everyone listening that it is possible to innovate in your space and make the impact that you most desire and want. Because I'm sure there are people out there that feel like their efforts aren't going anywhere. What would you say to those folks? I mean, I think that, you know, taking a step back and really, it's really hard when you're in the weeds. It's really hard when you're doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, really challenging work. Um, I know that you get blips of, you know, a great story or a great, you know, like you you have a win. Um, but overall, if you don't take time to kind of step back and view not only the work that you've done and that your organization's done, but also in connecting with people in other aspects of the industry, and, you know, reading articles, subscribing to, you know, specific media channels that are highlighting the macro big picture, you know, like abundant, you know, direction that the industry is headed, I think is really important because it gives you that fuel. Um, and then for us, you know, I laugh because I think sometimes people, people are like, what do you, what do you guys actually do? Right? Like, the future yeah. of impact was launched as a you know our team at one degree impact our decision to say the conversations we're having with our clients and with our partners and about the future of the industry is too important to be having in a vacuum and so while our day-to-day -day business is virtual grants management right like we come in and support clients all over the country with 
scaling their grants process and managing it for them and helping them go after more opportunity as efficiently as possible, there were bigger conversations that needed to be had on as big a, a stage as possible to say, there are people doing work that you need to know about, right? Like you need to know that there are tools like Hello Insight that can help you to measure the impact of your of the work you're doing every day if you're in the space of social emotional learning. There are people that you need to know, like what Stephen and Alicia and what Steve Latham are doing at GivePact and, and uh, donate stock. And if you want to expand your donor base and make it easier for your donors to be able to support you with their assets, right? right. Um, I think that as we, you know, hear from all of these executive directors who were not um, chosen by chance or coincidence to be innovators in the areas that their organization sits, that um, we just wanted to be able to show people that and create community around this like better way and future way of doing things. And what we found was we were hopeful of, but we were surprised by how big that community is of people who are thinking abundantly, innovatively, and who really see a very clear vision and path for how we move this industry forward to start, you know, solving the world's problems in a much quicker timeline. Absolutely. And I think um, to what you're saying, being able to find that community, have hard discussions about the things that people in this industry often face are important. And one of those hard discussions, a common theme that um, I think many people experience is what Steve Latham was talking about. So let's go ahead and take a look at that clip together. You've got to make it easy for people to donate what they want when they want. As consumers, we have become so spoiled by e-commerce being so easy that we now kind of apply that prism, that view to everything we do. Like, how do you become more donor-centric in everything you do? And, you know, this when year, the, 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 the capital's just not there, it's going to be the opportunity for them to take another look. Say, okay, what are we doing? How are we doing it? How do we do better? Nothing is static. Everything changes. And you have to evolve and with, with the changing conditions. And so I think it'll be better in the long term, but it's going to be painful for some near term. I mean, not having the capital to do what you want to do is extremely frustrating, but luckily you are here and you're kind of an expert at that. So what would you say to somebody that's facing a scenario like that? I think that, you know, as Steve mentioned, if you're reading the news, you know, Amazon laid off 10,000 people this week. Um, it's going to be rough. Like we're heading into a year where, you know, people see, you know, we're heading into um, some hard financial times as a country. Um, inflation's through the roof. We were talking to some clients in the food and security space who were saying that like they're losing government funding. They're, you know, inflation is, you know, increasing their costs to just provide what they used to provide is just so much more expensive. And now they're not getting the government support they used to. But I do know if history, you know, which always repeats itself, is this is the time to really lean into innovation and really rethink what you're doing as an organization and see opportunity. Um, I think that, you know, to Steve's point, there's going, it's going to be very hard. And I don't think that everyone's going to make it through this next year or two. Um, in some ways, although that's really hard to swallow, I think that it might be a good thing for the industry um, to kind of streamline. We've talked about kind of mergers and acquisitions and, and a roll up and consolidation of organizations in certain verticals. I think that some of that will happen naturally um, as we kind of get through this tough, you know, financial time. Um, you know, within our country and within the world. Um, but I do know that like, you know, again, history repeats itself. The greatest innovations have always come from the most challenging and trying times. And so I would say really assess what your bandwidth and what your resources are, and then make sure that you're not just doing the same things you've always done, but that you're finding partners who can help you to expand capacity by leaning into what they do best. Um, you know, we always say to our clients that like, we will get you, we, we are the best solution for what you're looking for in the grant space so that we can help manage the piece that we're experts at. And then you can go do the things that only you can do as a leader of this organization. Really lean into these alternative and kind of new funding platforms. So even though it feels overwhelming um, and maybe you have to do it at the expense of some of the older fundraising um, channels that you used to, that you're used to leaning into, but, you know, really exploring what's out there to make it as easy as possible for funders. Um, and donors to um, connect with your organization and give to your organization. And also just like 
remember why we're doing all of this. It's about the communities that we serve. And so in the chaos of everything and kind of trying to, you know, keep the wheels on is just making sure that you're always in touch with the communities and the voices of the people that you serve um, so that, again, you're being most efficient, you're delivering the most value and the most impact um, that you can because you know that it's what they need. I would say that's so powerful because being able to innovate in difficult times, remembering the why is is so hard, but probably in a way just as meaningful and important for these organizations and the work that you guys do as well. So, I mean, flipping it on on your side, what are some things creatively, um, maybe from some of the insights of the interviews that you've had? or just in general from experience of this last year that you're planning to do at One Degree Impact to uh, apply some of the newfound insight to the business and try to take your take everything to the next level? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, excited because we have so much clarity because of the show on, you know, what 2023 looks like. Besides the fact that I'll be a new mom, which is exciting and terrifying all at the same time. Yeah. So that'll be a new, maybe we'll get like a baby Sienna, uh, uh, you know, showing up on the show at some point. Yes. Um, community is our focus for 2023. We've been asked by a number of our clients um, and, you know, in doing the show and the community that we've started to build through that, um, to be able to connect a lot of these people together, a lot of these leaders of organizations, whether you're leading a nonprofit or, you know, a for-profit that's in the impact space or, you know, creating a technology platform solution or anything like that. Um, everybody is really, you know, kind of pining to be connected to each other. So community is going to be a major focus for us. Um, we know we're always, it's a, it's a daily obsession to be building the most efficient grants management machine. Um, and so our team is always, you know, from how we hire and who we bring on to the technologies that we use to support um, our processes and, and the systems that we build, that'll always be, you know, the, the, the core focus. But um, identifying new funding opportunities that we can bring into the fold um, to help to increase and get to positive ROI as quickly as possible for our clients. Um, and then I think that, uh, the show and the direction the show takes is going to be really exciting for season two. So you'll have to stay tuned. Um, I know we're at a mid January is what we're shooting for, um, for a season two premiere date. So as soon as we have that save the date, we will get it out to everybody. Any teasing as to what we're focusing on in the next season, ideas, topics, a speaker, if we want to be as audacious, maybe we won't have to. <laughs> we will not be as audacious as a speaker yet, although those announcements will be coming soon. Um, but I will say that the uh, general idea that we kind of heard from, you know, the audience, the community that we're building and the guests and our clients and our team uh, was really around going a little bit deeper into the causes um, and the and the ecosystem. That was like another big word that came out of this season for pretty much every single interview. Um, and so um, think more of a panel discussion um, and really how do we have uh, multiple points of view in one discussion so that we can go a lot deeper into the ecosystem around these causes to help kind of like understand them better and see and so people can understand where they can add the most value, um, but also to use real examples to showcase some of these new innovations and new opportunities that are out there. Yes, and if that excites you and you want to be part of the conversation, there are live streamed episodes where you can pop in, ask questions. All of that information will be out later. But if you feel that this these episodes have excited you and you're looking for more and a panel format just makes you like want to go out and change the world, then being in a room with those people, with Jess and all of these inspirational organizations is right where you need to be. So don't forget about that if you're listening too. <laughs> and in the meantime, we also, um, you know, the team is going to be really focused on making sure that we continue to grab like the best content from this past season. Um, and packaging it up in the most easy to digest way, because I know everybody's time, especially at the end of your giving season, is really um, tight. And so there will be tons of, you know, between now and January, there'll be tons of great content being put out. But, you know, definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and follow us on all the social media. We're on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn uh, for the future of impact, as well as one degree. Um, and our team is, you know, will be working through the holiday season to, to you know, answer any questions or help support any organizations that have questions as it relates to the work that we do today in grants management or, you know, our perspective on the future of impact. Well, just before we wrap up and send everyone off on their way, what is the biggest takeaway do you, you feel that our listeners should have gained from this season as a whole? Drop some wisdom on the mic, Jess. 
Ooh, that's a big one for the last for the last two minutes. Um, I would say, you know, really, I think that there is a great checklist um, and kind of resource um, list at the at the end of pretty much every episode. Um, you know, and kind of through our social content, we really tried to like list out all the different resources, whether it was the favorite books of the you know these the guests and 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 different tools and people and resources they follow to help them all the way down to like very specific tactical things. You know, we tried to have every episode have some inspiration, some thought leadership, and then some real like kind of tips and tools. Um, and so I would say, you know, grabbing some of that, um, each episode will have definitely some really good nuggets. Um, and I think that, again, just, you know, I feel immensely grat- grateful and have so much gratitude for, uh, you know, everybody who was a part of this season, everyone who's a part of, you know, the one degree impact family. Um, and I'm just really excited heading into, you know, the last few weeks of the year, um, about how this, how this year and how this season went and just all the exciting things that are to come for 2023. Yeah. And for me, it was how, how innovative some of these leaders are in the work that they're doing, how far they're willing to go and, um, how also, I don't know how to say this, just relatable and humble a lot of them were I feel like from my end you know you look at people that are doing great things and you must think that they might be nice but I don't know if they're like down to earth or they're like reachable in a way but I mean if you look at some of these great organizations and these great leaders like everyone just wants to make impact in the world and everyone is here to to work together to do that and um, I think for maybe uh, leaders who are maybe just starting to try to make impact in their organizations, they might look at people like that and think, well, I don't even know if I'll ever get to meet someone like that. Or maybe my reach won't be as far or help as many people. But hearing the these conversations and pulling that curtain back makes it feel more attainable, I guess yeah. the word is I'm look is that I'm looking for. for sure. Um so I'm excited to do that even more and bring everyone listening more content, action, value packed, inspirational, but also hopefully every now and then just relaxing and something to shut out from the world and the craziness that's happening out yeah. there. So absolutely, Jess. Well, thank you so much for being on your own show today. Thank you for hosting. <laughs> um, we are all looking forward to catching you for season two. In the meantime, have a lovely holiday off season, whatever it is you do or celebrate, and we'll catch you in January. Thanks, awesome. Jess. Thank you.